Well, hi, we are here today with um, Zach Halsma, a friend of mine from high school, and he has his own business. Uh, we're just going to be talking to him about that, about how everything's going there. Zach, it's good to meet you today, uh, or good to see you today. How's Close it going? enough, it's been long enough. Right, yeah, it's been, it's been a couple of years, a few years. What do we, we decide on, four years now since I've seen you, something like that? Something like that. <laughs> Three and four years, somewhere in between there. All right, for starters, let's see here, for uh, background, just give me a quick, you know, real general background review, like where you came from. We, uh, I, I, to get, to give our past connection, we were both in Lafayette, Indiana, at a certain point, and we both went to church there. We went to school at the same private school for a bit, and then kind of went our separate ways right after eighth grade or something. Yep. So, uh, born and raised in Lafayette, and that eighth grade year, it's, uh, it's 2000 actually, right on the nose, we, yeah. We graduated, and then I was hauled off to Muncie, <clears throat> and then spent my high school career there, plus a couple years, and went to Indy for just short of a year, and then I came up to Fort Wayne, and now here I am in little bitty town of Markle, just south of Fort Wayne, because nobody's here. <laughs> oh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, when did you meet your wife, or where? See here, I met her while I was still in Indy. Hillary, right? Yep, Hillary. And Hillary was uh, going to school for uh, high school French teaching. And so she had just been back not too long from spending or living in France for her schooling. France, wow. France, yes. That's Total immersion. Neat. So she speaks French? Fluently. Oh, wow. The only French I speak is bad. <laughs> Well, how apt she's working or she's helping with a bakery. I mean, you know, it's kind of ironic. She's eating all of it. I've never eaten any of it, and I make all of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, well, looks she's, delicious, so she's totally fluent in French. Uh, lived uh, lived there for a semester, and then when she came back to round out school was when I met her, and then. Best of all, we were together for a couple of months, and then I came up to Fort Wayne on transfer, and then she went straight down to the very southern end of uh, Indiana, so that made it interesting, but oh, she man. did a, a single year down there, and then she moved up, and we got married. Oh, nice. And you have two, just two kids? Two boys. Two boys. Yep. Oh, six, so... Four and six right now. Nice. Yeah, it's, I just met both of them. They're... They're cute little tykes. <laughs> um, the mullet helps. So does this mean you're getting the full four uh, family whatever income emergency checks that they're sending out? <laughs> Apparently families of four get a little bit more or something, four or more. I honestly have been trying not to look too deep into all of this. It just makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, that would put me right in there. That's where the, the limit is. Yeah. There you go. Uh, speaking of which, not to go on too long about the current unpleasantness, but coronavirus, how has that affected not only your business, but also the town of Markle from what you've seen? Well, uh, in case you guys haven't figured out, I have a bakery. And the coronavirus has absolutely shut down my, my wholesale aspect, but people can't get bread off the shelves anymore, so... Oh, that's it, true, yeah. So now my retail is spiking, so... Huh. Take the good with the bad, right? Yeah, um, I hadn't thought of that. I actually, just before I came out here to see you guys, we uh, were at the farmer's market up in Fort Wayne, and I had two eight-foot tables, four, three, four layers of bread deep, totally full, and I sold every last scrap of it. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> so about a couple hundred <laughs> loaves of bread right there, and it's all it all went. Nice. Um, but as to how it's affected me, the wholesale has completely smacked it upside the head, and it's made getting some stuff slower, but not impossible to get a hold of. Like my pallet of flour took an extra week for me to get, but it hasn't completely shut it all down yet. Uh, and the town... You know, it's everyone is playing the whole six foot rule that we're clearly embarking on here. Oh, right, yeah. Good buddy. <laughs> um, yeah, so people don't do this at home. Like, yes, don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> Be washed and sanitize. But uh, 
everyone is pretty much just hands off. A uh, couple of restaurants over here either shut down or only take out. So it's it's playing a little bit of havoc on the locality, but nothing nothing we can't get over with with a little bit of uh, ingenuity. Well, it's good to hear you're still making your way. I, I'm sorry, I've kind of skipped ahead of myself a little bit. Um, as far as business wise, you start a you work currently at a factory, as I understand it. Yep, I build uh, pickup trucks out at Government Motors, and I've been doing that for thirteen years now. Thirteen, man. And I've opened up this bakery three years ago. Yeah. And <clears throat> I am just about to quit the the truck job and do this full time. Well, that's great, man. That's really, really inspiring to hear. Like, that's good because it's uh, entrepreneurship at its finest right there. Right? <laughs> so you just started slowly uh, baking. Uh, well, first of all, how did you realize you wanted to bake? Is it something when, you did at home? When I did not grow up cooking, baking, any of it. It's My mom had a bread, ba- bread machine, and that was about the crux of that. So really it came out to when my first son was born six years ago. He, uh, my... I really wanted a sourdough that my mom used to make in, in said bread machine. So she didn't know what she was doing with it. She, she couldn't even remember what the recipe was, so I had to figure it out. So I started figuring it out. Had a hoot and a half. Made all kinds of breads, trying to get it all dialed in, figured out. And just slowly but surely, I finally found what I was looking for. And then people at GM started asking me to, if they could start buying breads from me. I'm like, sure. Well, can you make this? I don't see why not. So I started adding something else every now and then and just kept doing more and doing more. And then I've I've always wanted to open a business, but I never knew what to open up. So we, I was like, this is it. This is what we're going to do. That's awesome. That's really cool. Would you say that you found a sort of a passion there then? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Like you really enjoy making this stuff now? (laughs) I do. It's I understanding the mechanics of it, how the different things work together and what's doing what and mm. why and then just putting that up in just different con or different uh, uh, types of breads and why they all come out that way mm. I can take and make any variety of breads that pretty much without a recipe anymore because I, I know what I'm looking for what I needed to do and what it takes to make it work so it's it's definitely been a, a journey of fundamental learning Oh, I'm sure, yeah. And, and, and like I said before, everything, we were talking slightly before this, but everything you've been posting on Facebook, I've been keeping up with it for years now, I guess, at this point. And it all looks delicious, by the way. You, I, I think you've outdone yourself. Like, it, it all looks delicious. I would encourage all, all of our viewers, anybody who sees this, if you get a chance, please go to Markle, Indiana, and check out the the Bread Guy LLC. I don't know if we mentioned the name of your business yet, but it it's now. the Bread Guy LLC. And it's it's fantastic. It's a it's a really good. I, I I encourage to see this. Thank you. What we have here is a a couple of sourdoughs. They're midway sourdoughs specifically. They they have a half a whole wheat and half white flour cuts. So it's all the fluffiness of a white bread, but all the deliciousness of a true sour or of a true uh, whole wheat. And then this guy right here is a uh, almond croissant. Oh, nice. Um, True almond. Oh, they got to get a look at this. It's yeah. delicious. True, true almond frangipan in there. No fake flavors. I use no preservatives. I don't do anything to that. And that guy right there took three days from beginning to end to make. Three days. Three days. These loaves right here take uh, a solid twenty-four hours to to make from start to finish. Hmm. So, yeah, it's time is the greatest loss ingredient. Actually, that's a that's a good question. What would be, just out of curiosity, what would you say, or what takes the longest, or is the most difficult to make that the thing that you've made so far? Well, the longest to make is definitely the croissants. Probably really? the most difficult to make. I'm going to have to put it a toss up between brioche and ciabatta, because brioche is just an extremely technical bread to do if you're going to do it right and properly. Oh, really? That I don't want to bore everybody with the details <laughs> of. But let's just say you have to work it a long time and get it to hit a 
perfect milestone without going too far or coming up too short of if you want it done right. Huh. And then ciabatta, it's a big giant puddle of snot you're working with the entire time. So it's delicious, but there's a reason that it's big, airy uh, pockets of air in there because it's just loose and just... It's just the nature of it. Like, it is. It's huh. almost pure, even water and flour across the board, so it doesn't firm up like like a lo regular loaf of bread does. It just pools all over the place. Ugh. I had no idea that much went, went into making that, that kind of <laughs> stuff. I, I would think those would be simpler breads, you know? You'd think, well... Just for meeting them. Just for the, uh, the ingredient list, you would think so. <laughs> at, at least the, the ciabatta is just flour, water, salt, and yeast. Wow. That's it. But it's just simple. everything that it takes to actually pull it off is a right nightmare and makes you want to cuss. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Man. Yeah. You've been, sounds like you've been burning the candle at both ends here recently. With a blowtorch. <laughs> what with the, the, the GM and this going on and everything, but yeah, still having some business. Man, well, that's awesome. I'm really glad to see that it's just coming along and it's, you know, maybe we'll have some uh, a return. We'll have to do a, a return uh, podcast or interview here at some point to see in another couple of years or something or maybe next year and see how far it's gotten. Right. <laughs> well, the hope is as soon as uh, within the next couple of years, where we're sitting at right now is going to be one big giant commissary kitchen. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Go wow. big or go home, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> By all means. Yeah. Um, okay. The next thing I wanted to get on to, which is the other big issue, uh, back when we were in high school, this is more, I mean, it's kind of for me, but also for all Star Wars fans, back in high school, we didn't, I, we remember when episode one came out, and this is, you know, there were the, this is probably a little nerdy and stuff I'm sure it's about to get, but the original three movies that came out was all we had up until that point. And I remember specifically, I, I liked Star Wars, but you kind of got me into it a little bit more than the average bear because you knew I was more about a fan it. Fanboy through and through. <laughs> you knew a ton about it, and on top of that, like I, I think I started playing Star Wars cards because of you for a little bit. I mean, I, I didn't keep up with it, but it was still it was fun to play. It was a cool game, and uh, yeah, I remember all kinds of stuff like that. But uh, in your own words, where did it all break down, and how did it all break down? How did things go so wrong when they started out so right with Star Wars? Well, it all went straight downhill when they started out with episode one. You know, they, George, <laughs> George, Lucas, was just it. George Lucas sat here trying to claim that he held on to that little gem from the get-go. I call garbage because Jar Jar doesn't come out of the blue from, <laughs> from something as amazing as the original three movies. Han shot first. <laughs> and, but uh, Jar Jar was just terrible. Yeah, the portrayal of baby Darth Vader is oh, yeah. in just all of the most childish ways when they're trying to make him out his entire life to be this super iconic importance. Like, Wee! Just <laughs> was ear peeling right there. Mm. And just every single movie from there on, it was all about the merchandising and all about appealing to the children. And it never got better once Disney took over. So now, now it's not so much about the kids with Disney as it's all the feminazis and all that craziness goes. So go on ahead and hang me on a cross, ladies. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a lot of uh, social justice politics and things that have been inserted into movies recently. And certainly Star Wars has not gone by the wayside with that. Oh, absolutely not. Have you seen the, the new ones, the newest ones, after, after the episode one, two, and three, I guess? I fell asleep with the Han Solo one, but otherwise <laughs> I saw all of them, yes. You know, I did watch the Han Solo one, and if you took it as its own movie that wasn't part of the Star Wars franchise, maybe you could work it into something. But it, trying to include it and force it onto Han Solo and onto the whole thing, it just, I don't know, it felt like too much for me. Plus, there's a lot of different, yeah. It I was one of the on Oceans one. movie, you know, Oceans 11, Oceans 12. Yeah. It was that set to sci-fi. <laughs> it was <laughs> that was about it. Oh man. Yeah, it just I don't know, it seems like it's gone a little bit downhill after after all is said and done. Maybe it's downhill was a sheer cliff. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> I honestly I never thought I would see the day when there would be at, at Disney World or Disneyland, there's videos of, you know, little kids walking in 
and one of them is dressed, there's a little boy dressed like Darth Vader, and all the stormtroopers, because now they're stormtroopers at Disney, because they own it, are walking around with him, you know, in rank and file and all that, as if they're, you know, as if he's the real Darth Vader. And it's cute, it's funny, but I'm like, that doesn't, that takes away from the, any seriousness, any whatever tone that, that, like, that you would want to have to the, to the actual series is gone now. It's, it's like a cartoon, because these guys are walking around right next to Goofy, you know. Right. Minnie Mouse is sitting there hugging one of the storm, one of the stormtroopers or somebody. Just wait it's for just... the stormtroopers to have Mickey Mouse here as well, trooping <laughs> up to, to Vader. You know, it seems like I, I feel like I've already seen something like that. Like, a, what is it, C three or not C three PO? R two D two, slash like Mickey ears or something weird like that. <laughs> like they're they're doing all kinds of weird stuff, but it's just you know, ruined it, in my opinion. I don't know. It absolutely has. <laughs> it absolutely has. They they got away from the fan base as it was supposed to be, and the, the entire point of the movies as they were, and then just went straight on to uh, appeal to children who just want something pretty and they don't really care about any fundamental storyline, or they they wanted to appeal to the entire social justice crowd who is never given a rip about much of anything unless you have six gays, two lesbians, and 32... Uh, <laughs> Who knows what's out there? So oh, it's, yeah, it's it's a sad, sad thing. Yeah. And then they just can't leave well enough alone when they take and remake the movies and keep adding in a whole bunch of CGI and a bunch of extra stuff that they claim was there to begin with, but they didn't have the technology to have that stuff at that day and age anyways. So I hate to break it to you guys, Jabba was not in the first, or planned for the first one. When there was no guy in a giant slug suit squirming his way through, it was it was all yeah. computer generated and added in, and they're trying to throw it at us like, oh, oh this was right. going to be there, but we just put it on the cutting board, guys, because that's right. we're smarter than all you, I and then we're just going to that. take and have have Greedo take and start spraying fire all over the place when he is right here. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really. <laughs> Oh man, <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I had forgotten about that. That they actually went back and in digitally inserted all kinds of other things. They messed with the story so hardcore. What is it? Uh, Luke? Uh, Mark Hamill had his own qualms about that, which were qu quickly squashed, as I hear it. And then he was just pretty much forced to abide by his contract or something. Pretty much. And then uh, they they even switched him around again. I, I don't I I can't remember the movie's names now. But whatever one where he's on an island and he's drinking that green milk that comes out of that thing or whatever, Ugh. his attitude on that one is real defeatist. But then later on in another one of these movies, Rise of Skywalker, one of those, he's a ghost, and he's pretty much like changing his attitude about things, about how now there is hope and whatever, something. I don't know. It's yeah. just unnecessary. A lot of unnecessary. Well, it was, it was all in the effort to put all the glory on on the girl. Yeah. Who can miraculously do everything 100% amazingly. Yeah, that was another thing. Even throughout the original movies, and just about every movie out there, the guy fumbles his way through everything, and then he comes into his own, figures it out. But the girls can do everything because women are amazing. And I'm not going to refute that. Women are pretty amazing. Ain't nobody that amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suddenly Leia can fly out into space and do and stuff. Float and right back on in. Float right back do, on do, in. Do, do, do. Wee. Why not? You know, Luke's, <laughs> like you said, Luke struggled with his learning how to use the Force, but somehow everyone else grasps it just fine. It's like they've been doing it their entire lives. Entire lives. Actually, not even Yoda didn't even fly in space. What's going on? Like, I know, right? He didn't do anything like that. I he, thought it was overkill when he was sitting there flipping somersaults all well, over the Count place. And and, uh, <laughs> yeah, but at least he didn't do anything so extreme as to be like, no air, no need to breathe. You're Blood is literally boiling in your veins. I think I went over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would think he would use that power if he had it. I don't know. Maybe it was too dark for him. Yeah, it was so dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so are you hopeful then for the future of the Star Wars franchise? If Disney sells it. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the only way, isn't it? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Oh, man. Everyone's inside right now. Everyone is stuck inside with cabin fever, and they all have, you know, the children, and you were saying, like, a, I think Sam was making the joke or something, that so, somebody said something about 
getting things out in the open with your wife now or with your significant other now, the, all the things that you didn't have time to discuss before, how hectic is it for you at home right now? Or is it well, not? It's not hectic yet. It's, I literally just got tossed out of GM after their little PR farce. Can you check are, this out. Are so, they open right now or shut down? No, or now they're down. On? What's going GM on? GM and the union, mm. after both of them have just been completely smeared across the boards for so much corruption and all kinds of stuff. The union's about to potentially get thrown under the government's uh, umbrella. Really? And just, yeah, because they're just so rife with corruption. But they decided that coronavirus is so all, all encompassing and evil that we've got to shut down the factories. We get all of our parts from China and from other countries that are all being heavily affected, which, as far as Corona is concerned, makes sense. But the union is, goes out there and makes a big media statement. Hey, everybody, we're shutting the big three down. Ford, Chrysler, GM, all factories, all productions, they're all done and out. But then Chrysler did shut everything down immediately. I think Ford did or was pretty close to, but GM came out with the wonderful statement of effective immediately, we are going to begin the systematic shutdown of our entire production. All the media heard and all the people heard that was what they wanted to hear. Beginning immediately, we're going to shut down. Never minding the fact that they said systematic, systematic, which means whenever I flip and want to. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so they actually slated uh, my plant to shut down next Friday, two solid weeks into uh, them actually pronouncing all this uh, pandemic, they, that they decided to, that they were going to shutter the factory. Well, then all that fiasco got out there, and they're like, uh, uh, Guys, we're running out the plant the rest of tonight and into tomorrow, and we're going to mothball the place and shut down. Guys, uh, get out. <laughs> like, That's kind of abrupt. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> you get called out, then it's, it's going to happen real fast. Wow. So I'm not home just yet. Oh. Uh, as it was pretty much, I was in shop all morning from 5, 5.30 in the morning up until going to GM, mothball the place, and I had to come back until to finish out some stuff until 8. And I was up uh, early this morning again to go to the farmer's market and then rounding out with this. So I'm not, this is the first time I'm really going to be home is after we uh, close up. And then we get to let the fun begin. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, I know better than to say some really off-the-wall stuff like, <laughs> honey, that hair color looks really weird. Or... <laughs> Are you sure that you took care of that, or I'm right? <laughs> Surefire things that get anyone thrown under the bus. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, just just hold it in for another oh, whatever it is, eight weeks or whatever we've got left. It's kind of up in the air. Yeah, as far as I hear it, I would say two to three months before we're effectively back on the upswing from everything I'm understanding. Yeah, I well, from everywhere I'm looking, I'm getting all kinds of mixed information because the, the media is saying one thing, you know, the conservative media is kind of saying another thing, more or less, and then just other people and other outlets, YouTubers and people are saying other things. Senator Ted Cruz has a podcast that he does with, uh, I think it's Michael Knowles from um, Daily Wire. Wire, but he's, I mean, I, I like to watch it because it's very current. He's up to date on what's going on, and even he's not sure because it's everything that gets passed or that they're, they're trying to propose, different people are trying to propose different things as I understand it right now. And e even the amount of these checks, which may or may not go out apparently, are uh, it, even that's up in the air. That's what I was saying earlier, you, you might get more for two kids hopefully, that's I what might. they're suggesting. Or they may say that I make too much money even though I'm not <laughs> pulling a home and I'm just gonna be SOL. Maybe, uh, I hope It not. also doesn't help the the Democrats are all fighting against the fact that Orange Man said this is the, what he wants to do, so we automatically have to go against it. We were talking about that on the way here. It, it, isn't that what they've been arguing for? And then suddenly now that Trump is suggesting it or something, uh, I, yeah. they're, they're trying to block it. They're trying to say we should get more, uh, what is it, unemployment benefits instead, expand the unemployment, which I don't see how will help as much as or as quick as checks. Well, because... I mean, this would be the first thing the Democrats would go to, but because Trump said, 
I want to do this, this automatically, this is the worst thing in the world we could possibly do. What are you, a Nazi? I mean, they, they just blow everything so far out of proportion. And then the media can't ever listen to anything they say because they're just going to take whatever they want and then angle in that direction to the point that it's so false, even though it's technically true in some regards, that they can basically get away with murder on it. So you can't listen to any of them, left or right. You know, they, everyone's got their angle, but they're going to attack those angles so viciously that you, you really can't even listen to both of them in hopes of getting somewhere in the middle. Yeah, it seems pretty conflicted, the information that's coming out. Uh, as, uh, even information on the source or on China, who should we should really be taking a closer look at after this, all that's conflicted too. We, we, Sam and I, once again, we were talking about on the way here and everything, and China, it, this is not the first time. It's not the first time something's happened with them. The uh, was it the other flu, there was one of the other, the bird flu and also... Swine flu. Swine flu, was it swine flu? Maybe it swine was. flu, there was another, uh, SARS, that's what it was. SARS, there's a few different things that have kind of come out of there or at least expanded rapidly in there and then spread. And it's always been a big, it's not, a, it's not always a pandemic like this time, but it's always been a big deal. And it keeps coming from China. And, they, and they're markets. denying it. Mm-hmm. It's those big old wet markets, you know, they... Those don't help, they are for sure. the most unsanitary conditions ever. And then they just have a heyday with it as a society. And then they start, they're making all of our stuff and the, with just all the gnarliness that they're concocting over there. And then they ship all this stuff here with these wonderful little uh, outriggers sitting here riding along. And then, oh my God, here we are in Corona land. Exactly. So you're telling me you're not going to start making bat loaf or something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was sounding pretty tasty, but I couldn't think of the right seasoning for it. <laughs> <laughs> you should make one like a dessert that's shaped like a bat or something like that. That'd be right, funny. Just taking... I'll bet they'd sell. Out. No, I probably would. <laughs> I bet I could, find, one. I could find a market for just about anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so in starting your uh, in the Bread Guy LLC, walk me through how that went and what kind of challenges did you face in the entrepreneurship process there? For sure. Yeah, one of the, really honestly, the biggest thing is working up the gumption to even pull the trigger. That's where everybody falls flat on their face and it's like i would love to open x you know i want to open a restaurant i want to open a nail salon i want to open up just about anything you know take your pick and it all they always have the best ideas you always come up with this thing that thing you know you have a gift in this field and so many people just get paralysis of analysis and they just let that peter off so the first step is definitely find what you're good at figure out how to monetize it, and you're never going to have it perfect. You just have to do it. Uh, and then after that, it's really honestly easy. You you go to the government websites to file your, your papers to get your EINs and go to the IRS to get your tax IDs, and all that's really honestly simple and it doesn't cost all that much, maybe a couple hundred bucks between all of the registrations, at least for Indiana. Yeah, uh, that's about what it costs for ours, or our, our painting business we have. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's not over the top expensive to do it, to start it. And then after that, it's just, how are you gonna go about doing it? Are you, do you need a brick and mortar? Can you do it from home? Can you do it from online? Is it something you can have people helping you with? Do you need to find partners or do you, can you do this 100% yourself? You know, figure out all those little details, figure out how you need to structure yourself and then just start doing it. Hmm. You know, that's, everyone just flips out and freezes and, you know, anytime you can start something without taking out any money is the best thing you can do. And just keep putting the money you pull in, put it right back into the business. And if you're not pulling any money in, you're doing something wrong fundamentally, and either you shouldn't be doing the business or you shouldn't be doing the business as you are, and you need to figure out what you need to change. But I've, I've had so many variables, iterations of the bakery, like the, 
direction and pathways that I was going to move with this business that if somebody were to hand me a blank check and say, I'm going to give you a million dollars, you got a great idea and a talent and a gift, go. I guarantee you I would waste that million dollars and within the span of a couple of years, I would go belly up because I didn't take the time to culture myself, to figure out what works, why, how, and just working that all through. And even though everybody wants that get rich quick, they want, they're going to be the, the next big thing, the overnight success. No overnight success is truly overnight. They're at least four or five years in the making. So can't get discouraged, can't let it get under your skin, the people can't see what an amazing product you have, even if it is the most superior thing in the land. People are only going to see what they see, want to see, or what they're used to. So just slug it out, get through it, and just do it. <laughs> to, to take it from Nike, just do it. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. Complain about something, figure out what's wrong, and you do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Just that commitment. Yeah. Over, overarching commitment that there's, there's nothing to stop you. You don't procrastinate. You don't put it off. You just you see a problem. You fix it, carry on. Mm -hmm. About the best way to think about it is you're walking in a dark room and you're just feeling for a door. You feel for absolute sure that going this way is the right way. Yeah, hit your nose right square on the wall. Just turn and go another way. Don't just sit on the floor and wait for the lights to turn on because they're not going to. Right. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be a thing. Um, not only in entrepreneurship, with, but in any other little thing like that, any, uh, well, I guess entrepreneurship, selling things, whatever, whatever you put your hand to, if you just keep doing it, eventually you'll be some, somewhat of a success, it seems like. We were talking about that on the way here. There's a, there's a film studio called Asylum Studios, just as an example, that makes really, really crappy um, B movies. And they make ripoffs of every, or they have made ripoffs of every single big movie that's come out. Uh, what was it? War of the Worlds. They've just put H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds in front of the title. And they've done similar stuff with a bunch of other big titles like that. Uh, I think The Meg or something. There's been a few. With, they've done a lot with sharks for some reason. <laughs> but think, think Sharknado or something like that. But really, really, you know, terrible. But over time, they've done so many of these. They've kind of, they've made money. Be because they're putting out such crappy quality, within like four months, they can make a movie once they decide to make it. It's that bad but they don't take themselves too seriously and people know that. Because of that, they've built up just enough of a following. They've never lost money on the movie, ever. Apparently it's a thing. These big studios are going all out and they're, they don't even, they, the funny thing is they don't even have original ideas in the big studios, but this small studio that's <laughs> ripping off the ripoffs is still making more money than, they, than them or more take home in a way, I guess. Like a, a larger percentage of their income is going back because they're just, <laughs> It was just funny. But the, the, that repetition seems to be key and just keep doing whatever. Right. You, you dial in what you can do. You figure out what it is that you're doing wrong and you fix that. You find your crowd. You know, everyone that gets into a business assumes that there's a million people here. Well, then every one of those million people are going to come flock into me. <laughs> right. Not even five of them want to come flock into you. The four that do are your family. So... <laughs> You gotta, you gotta take the time to figure out what it takes to get them to you and what you need to do to make it happen. I mean, when I started this, I picked a little sleepy town of Marco because it is central to this entire region. Mm -hmm. I got Fort Wayne up to the north. I've got Huntington to my left. I got Wells County, which is uh, Bluffton, to my right. I got Marion to the, just to the south of me. I am square in the middle of all these places. Mm -hmm. So the original game plan was wholesale. I am going to wholesale the crap out of yeah. everything and just go to town because it's like I'm right here. It's a cheap place. I got everything I need, and I am right off the interstate that I can just get everywhere that I need to go. You were right there. It took me three years. I got one wholesale account within a... Uh, a year and a half, I think. And it was just a little cafe, a little coffee shop. I was maybe pulling 40, 50 bucks uh, a week on a good week from them. 
I think that's nothing to live off of right there. And I, it just, it got me down, you know? But at that point, so many people would just say, well, the plan was wholesale. Big goods, wholesale, it flopped. I can't keep up with this. And then they would have given up. It's like, well, what else can I do? So I started trying to figure out retail things. I started opening up uh, my facilities here, which also did flop, just because they're a small town and they just don't really care about the kind of product I put out because it's a bunch of old farmers. Oh. So it's not my demographic. I need all the hipsters up in Fort Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, the kind of location I'd be looking at apples to apples is 10 times more expensive up literally, uh, up in Fort Wayne is what it is here. So how did I get around that? Farmers markets, you know, start catering, started just doing a whole bunch of like little things, just reaching out, pushing out there. I keep flip, flipping for that light switch. I mean, I keep stubbing my finger on the wall, but then it eventually made full circle. I got my name out there enough. I had enough people that were familiar with me that a couple of the uh, the local bakeries had either quit or shifted their aim and focus and left a huge hole in the wholesale market. Wow. So then I was able to come full circle right back into the original game plan that wasn't working, but instead of it coming out of the gate in year one, it took me three years to do it. And here I now have nine different restaurants that I'm taking care of. Really? On top of the farmer's markets and caterings and everything else that I do. Oh, wow. Um, so it's, you got to keep, just keep doing it and keep adjusting and looking for what are you doing wrong? Or even if you're not doing it wrong, why is it not working? Because not everything is your fault. <laughs> as much as you might feel like it, it's not your fault, but you just keep going. So, yeah. Wow. Now there's, I've got two employees plus my wife and I, and we're getting to be a pretty well-known name here in Allen County. And I, my goal was to get to be a regional name overall. So, huh. well, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, and and right now in particular, it's kind of ironic that you have that whole setup and everything, and you're between everybody, and you're selling bread at this moment. Because you have, like you said, position-wise, if they run out in other towns, they could all come here, or people could come here. Mm -hmm. And well, like you said, farmer's market and all that, I'm sure you're making a decent amount there. It's, it's, just, it's good to hear that you were able to make some more money right now. I mean, like, in this whole pandemic thing going on right now, is another perfect example. Several of, the, uh, several of my competitors have already boarded up shop for the time being, waiting really? for this storm to pass. Huh. This is the perfect chance and opportunity to do something. Yeah, your name's going to get out there. They still have the the rent they got to pay. They still have the facilitation they got to pay. So why aren't they using it? Why aren't they taking the opportunity to figure things out? For me, it, it has turned back into a wholesale directive for me, but I lost 90% of my wholesale uh, through all of this. When all the restaurants are shutting down, you know, Burgers aren't exactly the most lucrative thing when they've got things like steaks, and I deal with a lot of whole high-end uh, restaurants. They're going to push the higher margin items that they got that doesn't encapsulate my stuff. So my stuff is just went straight down on the wholesale. So I'm taking all these opportunities to figure out, well, all right, I can't get people to come here to save my life because itty bitty town and Otherwise, people have to come all the way down here from Fort Wayne and surrounding areas. They don't really care to. So what do I do? Well, I went and bought a trailer a couple months back. I'm going to start trying to figure out how to deliver to specific towns on specific days. Get, oh, nice. Getting people's heads that, hey, there's going to be bread here because you can't get it on the shelves. So place your orders, get all your stuff in, and you know, it's like you got to keep figuring things out because not every instance are you going to be able to take that same square peg and ha hammer it into that circle hole or vice versa. So people are just so prone to just boarding up and cutting it off and just wait out the storm. And if I play my cards right, then I'm not going to come out the other end the same way. I'm going to come out just 
ballooning over everybody. Yes, this could be big. So that's the the goal and and hope. Turn this big basket of lemons into a big pitcher of lemonade. Well, thank the Lord for that. That's that's awesome. That's pretty cool. It's nice to hear that you're uh, well, not only doing all right, but kind of potentially making headway here during this time when we're all yeah. stuck indoors. <laughs> at least hey, at least you're not somewhere on Facebook. Right. <laughs> but that's just getting annoying at this point. Yeah. You know, you just got to keep looking for the opportunities and then pursue the opportunities when you find them. And just always remember, you're never going to find the perfect way to do it. Otherwise, you're just going to sit there and paralysis of the analysis. So uh, what are your plans for the future then with this business? Or like your overall vision? Let's just dream here for a minute. The overarching dream is eventually to... This is a 13,000 square foot uh, facility. I want to turn the entire thing into a commissary style kitchen, which basically I'll be doing all of my stuff in here and even be able to appeal to uh, the any other cooks of any variety that's looking to get it more into wholesale because again, this town is no good for retail, but it's perfect for wholesale if you can get your foot in the door. So if I can get people in here that are trying to reach reach out to a whole region instead of just Markle or just Fort Wayne or just Huntington or just Bluffton, then you know this is where they can just get out everywhere. And I can try to get them in here. So that's that's one. I want to open up kitchen space to people that need it. Another thing is I would like to open up uh, basically little not pop up shelves, but little shoebox size storefronts where I can take all the completed breads that I've made here and take them and set them in all these strategic locations and just, I can control everything from home base and just ship it out, let all the retail happen out there in each of those specific uh, storefronts. They order how much bread they need, just like they are their own business, and then I will deliver it to them and then they will disseminate between that and selling off my uh, croissant pockets and soon to be uh, pretzel pockets. And I make these beautiful little gems just chock full of meats and cheeses and just a punch of flavor you wouldn't believe. And that's, that's my ticket out into the, the public eye because it's a totally unique product. That took me two years it to is. come up with. It's, that wasn't even something that was right there in front of me when I started this. That was the, the beginning idea of, I'm going to open a bakery. You know, the original idea was this guy. Just this straight, simple, straight loaves of bread. <laughs> you just got to keep expanding, expounding, and figuring out what works. Yeah, that's amazing. I, um, it reminds me of, I watched a little short thing it was like an educational clip, I think, for some... It was informing on a, how a bread guy used to do things in the 50s. And I think it was like Wonder Bread, something like that. Just one of those big, bigger name bread things. But even that guy, he had his little bread truck, and he would go around, and he would try and upsell the... It showed him trying to upsell the shopkeepers and whatever on different things. And he was just doing basic bread, but he had little you know, pies and stuff, too. Um, but it sounds very similar to what you're talking about. Like, you wouldn't need to be part of a company to go around and do all that. As long as you're a self-starter, you can go around and probably do a ton Absolutely. of footwork yourself. And nobody knows your product like you. So get out there and exactly. tell everybody why your product is the best. Because exactly. nobody else is going to be able to do that until you've already done it so much that everybody has to know what your product is. You also have to have a bit of a leadership skills, I suppose is a good way to say it for something like this. Uh, even just uh, each one of these things, it's like its own ball game in a sense. You're combining a lot of different stuff here to make this happen. That's why it's so amazing to me, but also just in general, the idea of entrepreneurship is really cool because you have to juggle a lot of balls pretty much. You're doing all the time of the work. Plus for you, you've got two jobs going on or did more. you got GM and this. On top of that, you have a family to watch out, watch out for and take care of. And you have two employees, you have to be a good leader to them and a good boss and run, run things efficiently and then run the business and there's finances. It's just a ton of stuff to juggle. It is. 
but in the end, it comes down to the vision that you have. You know, so long as you can pick out that point and kind of think about it like if you're mowing the lawn. If you're just looking straight down while you're mowing, you're going to sit here and be wiggling all over the, the yard and never going to have a straight line. But if you just keep your eye right on that far point, you just keep working towards that, everything else falls in line. Because if you're going that way, you're going to make that minor adjustment, you know, hey, finances over here are messed up. We need to get here. So you got to pull that back in over here. Your employees are doing something. Well, that's not going to get you over here. So you got to pull them back in over here. And it sounds complicated on that same token. If all roads lead to here, then it makes it clear as day what you need to tell people how and what to do because you know where you've got to go. So I am the Bread Guy LLC based out here in Markle, downtown Markle. Uh, I come on down and place orders. Uh, my Facebook page is the Bread Guy LLC and I'm also on Instagram and uh, if there's ever anything that somebody needs and I can figure out how to do it, there's not much I can't do. Absolutely. Well, hey, thanks for being here. They're letting us come in and see your great place and, uh, you know, sample some stuff and whatnot. We really appreciate it. Um, please do check out his Facebook page. He has all kinds of stuff that just looks delicious. But the bread guy, and uh, as always, if you like anything that we do or if you want to comment, you know, please feel free, share, like, subscribe, and we will see you in the next video.